So good afternoon, everyone, and a warm, warm welcome to this, our third uh, lecture in the lecture series, Ancient Attire. Um, this afternoon, uh, we have Dr. Søren Lorenzen from the University of Bonn, who's going to give a lecture on the high priest in the Hebrew Bible and his glorious camouflage. Søren, Dr. Lorenzen, um, is a research associate at the University of Bonn. He got his PhD degree in Hebrew Bible studies from the University of Aarhus. And so far, his research has been concentrating on questions of identity, language, and embodiment in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Saren has a book that is almost out. We think it's going to be out um, either next week or during the first couple of weeks of November. Uh, it's being published by Moore Seebeck, and the title is Spoken into Being self and names in the Hebrew Bible. And this book, uh, which is a revised version of Søren's PhD thesis, here he examines the entanglements of persons, names, and also of the self and selfhood in the Hebrew Bible. And I have actually been lucky enough to read a copy of it, even though it's not published yet, and I would say it's warmly recommended. And Søren just told me it's actually possible to pre-order it already now on Morsebex. Um, website. Actually, Søren told me not to say that, but I'm saying it now anyway. Um, the lecture we're going to hear today, this afternoon, which I'm looking very much forward to, is in a way a sneak peek into Søren's new uh, field of, of research, which is uh, looking into colors, color symbolism uh, in the Hebrew Bible and in ancient Israel. So with these words, I'm going to put a pin in Søren, as you do in Zoom. Um, and I'm going to let him have the Zoom room. So, Søren, take Thank it away. You. The floor is yours. And I should probably uh, mention that um, Søren has roughly 30 minutes. And then we have ample time for questions uh, and discussion afterwards. So please, Søren, go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much for bringing me here. Uh, it has... Uh, it's 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 funny because like I've just come from teaching and I was in German. Then I had like a, a small ten minute oasis of Danish speaking with Anne, and now I'm in English. And it, it was uh, so it's uh, so if it's all it's going to be a mess uh, in the Zukunft, then uh, that's why. Uh, there you go. But uh, I'm thankful for being here. Thank you for that you all here. It's uh, very nice. I'm in my office, and uh, today we are listening to. A lecture by me, or we are listening, we're trying to, on the high priest and his glorious camouflage. And the reason why I chose this title was because it plays in this double-sided role that uh, at one point, uh, like at, and then on one hand, then we have the high priest as he is, uh, he's drawing attention to himself because he has to do that inside the tabernacle. And the other side, that he's kind of disappearing into the color scheme of the tabernacle. And I liked uh, the both of those uh, ways. To understand things. And last lecture, we had uh, Laura Quick with the, uh, she briefly mentioned the priestly attire in relation to the, um, the marriage metaphor in Ezekiel 16. And I think it was convincingly argued that this metaphor played on clothing and stripping uh, the statues of like uh, the yeah divine statues. And uh, we are kind of just like continuing along this way a little bit and then we'll get at it. Yeah. So why the priestly clothing? So in recent years, there's no doubt that materiality in general has swept over um, Hebrew Bible studies and humanities in general. And for our specific question, then it's about dress and, and, uh, and, and jewelry and so on. I, I, I highly recommend Laura Quick's book, uh, Dress Adornment on the Body in Hebrew Bible, if you are more interested in this side of the ancient uh, studies. But why the priestly clothing? Well. I think in the recent five years, several articles has been published on, uh, on the priestly clothing. It has both been about the priest specific pieces, the specific pieces of his vestments, the functions of his equipment, uh, such as the possible divination function of his urim and tumim, uh, the similarities of his clothing of priests uh, that you find in the ancient Near East, in Egypt and in Mesopotamia, but also how it describes the priest um, in the second temple period or even how it's been received by Philo in, 
in the study. So like there's been a lot of writing on the high priest. And in that way, we're basically just like skipping the waters and continuing this way. But we'll try to do a different view and look at the colors involved today. And uh, why colors actually? Well, colors in the Hebrew Bible are embodied colors. That's very important to remember is that this embodied colors is a term that I have borrowed from Lourdes Urenia, who recently published a book on green in the Hebrew Bible. And um, what this means is that you never have the abstract category of green. You always have sick green, leafy green, or this drink cup green. And I think that's, that's pretty uh, important for us to remember. And that's also why we come to the attire part, because a salient color for us today is purple in two different nuances. And this purple is never understood as an, understood as an abstract purple, but it's connected to a specific fabric. And uh, actually to the extent that when you mention the color, you automatically mean the fabric that it's metonymically related to. But um, we'll look at these colors and then we'll try to take an experimental look from a newer theory from a Scottish art historian uh, called David Batchelor on chromophobia. This whole idea that why are colors, are they actually dangerous? Are they secondary? And I feel like uh, that can give us something to talk about or speak about today. But first of all, um, we have to um, uh, understand where are we in the narrative story when we get uh, the description of the ancient, of the high priest. We are in the desert. We have just expect, uh, escaped, ex, um, escaped Egypt during the Exodus. And now we are in the, the, um, the desert. And here we will start building. We'll start building a tabernacle and we'll start making clothes that fits this tabernacle for the high priest. And we have just stopped actually at Mount Sinai in the middle of the forest. So we in the middle of the forest, middle of the desert, so we can talk a little with God. But we are far from civilization. And that might show a little where we are in the story, that it's a little hard to get the, the equipment we need for the, for, to build these things. And it shows a little uh, how this uh, story has a slightly fantastical streak. But, uh, but the description of the clothes might be fairly accurate if we look to much later times and Hellenistic times. Because right now in the told story, we are somewhere stuck in the Bronze Age. And uh, we'll try to uh, look at this here. But before we look at the clothes, actually, it's quite important to know that there are two tiers of priests in the Israelite systems here. The priests have to come, both the high priest and the ordinary priest, need to come from the tribe of Levi. Um, that is quite important to understand. And they have two different functions. Um, the Le Levites are basically, when they have the priestly function, is that they serve the day-to-day -day business with the families outside of the tabernacle. They take care of the sacrifices and so. And the high priest has a special role to play. He plays a special role inside the tabernacle. And there's only one of these guys. And he has to be a son of Aaron, very specifically, still within the Levitic tribe, but he has to be a son of Aaron. Good, but let's begin to look at this beautiful clothing that we have. I have a very authentic picture on the side. And that's a very big lie, of course, because there are so many reconstructions of this. And this was the one I found on Wikipedia. So like, uh, but it's, it's all good. But we have to start about this clothing that we find in chapter 28 of Exodus. So all priests wear a tunic and a sash. The tunic, that's the first item. It's worn by, it's made of fine linen. And it's worn by all priests. Fine linen does not have a specific color. It's not described as a specific color, but there's a large consensus that sesh is a fine Egyptian, uh, it's an Egyptian loan word of a fine white fabric. So a whitish tone is uh, mostly what we expect here. And this is also because sesh refers to alabaster, the things we make uh, plaster out of. Yeah, this mineral, yeah. And uh, the, the, as you see in this authentic picture, it was presumably ankle length. Yeah, down, down, to the, down to the feet. And then we have the sash. The sash was also made of fine linen, and, but it was woven with purple and red colored thread. The colors are not specified in Exodus 28, where we actually get the instructions, but it appears in chapter 39, uh, later when we get this list of what belongs to the tabernacle. 
we get it in form of a like a here in chapter 39 we get like a recap in the typical list uh, science of lists that we see in ancient Israel and um, it's a smaller piece of clothing it's a little sash and Carmen Imes argues that you can't actually see it on the high priest because it would be underneath his robe but all priests, all priests, they wear this, uh, these two things, uh, the high priest included. But the high priest has a little more razzle-dazzle. Uh, he has a little more things that blings, and he has also something that makes sound. Uh, so let's go to uh, him. I have, uh, by the way, I have here blue, purple, and red, purple, and crimson yarns. That is the fabrics, the colors that we are noticing here, particularly the purple. Good. First of all, he has... An ephod. We described that last week. We Laura, Laura Crick uh, sh shortly addressed this, but uh, and it's a little complicated uh, because there it has seen very very many different uh, um, recreations and like how what this should uh, look like. But it sure was a luxurious piece of garment, and it appears as a sort of apron, but of uncertain size. And uh, that's what Laura Quick noted late, late last time. It's like it's possibly something as a cultic object that could be worn by statues as well. And this connection has also been highlighted by Carmen Imes. Um, but no matter what, it's a heavy kind of equipment, and it's made of blue, purple, red, purple, and crimson. And it's heavy, and it's attached over the shoulders with stones, onyx stones, and on these, we have engraved names. And that's what I've marked here with green, that you should set these two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ifrit as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear the, their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. So we have these two stones sitting up here as a remembrance for Yahweh. But on top of the ifrit, we have a breast piece that is added. This breast piece is um, attached with 12 different kinds of precious stones. It is difficult to describe fully uh, the colors of all the stones, but red, blue, and green seem to be present. It's what you in German would call bunt. That's a word I've learned from my daughter who's in German school. And no matter the meaning of what color this materiality has, what kind of color, carnelian, chrysolite, emerald, uh, turquoise, sapphire, moonstone, then, then it's a lot of colors going on here. And Elena Lyle has recently argued that it's actually more the areas of the specific stones that might be of interest here. Where were they found? And that's very interesting because then that would signify in Lyle's terms that that would signify the universality of God. Like he is basically everywhere and these stones are found everywhere. That's an interesting um, uh, interpretation and definitely worth exploring more. But yeah. As you see here, together these objects with the ifrit and, um, and the stones he has on the shoulders, then the high priestly vestments, and they are to remember, uh, to uh, basically trigger God's memory. As Barat Ilman has shown, then, uh, then the priestly source from where this is taken accentuates that God remembers the Israelites in contrast to other places in the Bible, for example, Deuteronomy, where the burden of memory is put on the human being. And it's very interesting to see that here because through all of these things, uh, through the high priest's clothing, we see that the high priest enters to activate the sensorium of God. And I'm quite sure somebody here will also uh, speak about uh, smell in that genre. But let's just stay with the, with the visible uh, sense right now because there's definitely uh, something going on here. But yeah, let's uh, continue because we don't have all that time in the world. Yeah, so yeah, let's go. He has also a robe with bells on it. This is made of solely one color, one continuous color of blue purple. That's dark purple, yeah. And it's him, around it's him. You can also see on this very legit picture. It is attached with the uh, ornamental pomegranates and bells. And these bells are explicitly said to be there uh, because um, um, because um, he is in danger, basically. It's so that he does not die. They make this sound when he walks around. That's very important because it underlines the area of danger we are in. And that uh, is something we would like to carry on uh, when we go a little further in this lecture. The final element of the high priest's um, clothing is the turban with the diadem. While all priests wore a cap of white linen, uh, the high priest wore something different, perhaps a larger turban-like headdress. The key object here is the diadem, 
Um, and this is a piece of jewelry attached to his forehead. It's not directly described as a crown, but it's more like a plate of luminous metal uh, for engraving something. It's light emitting, um, which is something we also addressed in the last lecture. On this plate, there's written uh, holy for Yahweh. Yeah? And, um, and uh, it signifies that uh, what is coming in here is something that belongs to God's sphere. And that is probably a relevant observation because the clothing here is such an integral part of the place the high priest is going that he disappears into this place. He, play, he disappears into Yahweh's uh, area. So this outfit could resemble a cult statue. That is what we have been maybe addressed a little last time. And uh, Christine Palmer has also has gone in this direction and argued that uh, the high priest, high priest represents the divine on earth. This is key because the ordinary Israelite are not allowed to go inside the tabernacle where God is. Only the high priest is. But as he exits the sanctuary, he brings out the views, the smells, and everything from what's inside and basically becomes an embodied living statue that signifies who God is to the Israelites. But what happens to Aaron, actually, or any of his sons that are to wear this outfit? So a big part of being dressed is that a person intermingles with what one is wearing. As with most things in our lives, also presently, is that we are not buffered individuals, uh, to borrow a term from the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, like our boundaries don't really stop at our skin since we are tangled with the world around us. We are not just individuals who wear clothes, we partake in the clothes. Clothes maketh the man. And the high priest partakes in Yahweh's colorful world by getting clothed. And he, because it has to be a he, assumes a different kind of existence through these clothes. Um, but he does not only become part of the clothes. Since the clothes is so close to being what is made of the tabernacle, he also becomes part of the tabernacle. His glorious outfit is also a camouflage of sorts. But before we fully go to the camouflage part, uh, we need to go uh, look at the salient colors he's wearing. Exactly, purple. So, as has been frequently noticed, the color purple was a luxurious color. It was born, worn by royalty, leaders, and uh, statues of deities. The two shades of purple were made by either Murex Tronculus uh, or Bulinus Pantais. Sorry to all the Latin speakers, native speakers here. But anyways, these very fancy Latin words uh, refer to mollusks, that is sea snails, that live in the Mediterranean Sea. For the first kind of snail, uh, you have to dive at least nine meters to find them. And that's when you want the, um, and for the other one, you can dive only two meters. So nine meters and two meters, but you have to go underwater to find them. And you can use the glands from these sea snails to make the color of agaman, that is red purple on the right here, and ticklet blue purple on the left. For the agaman color, uh, you would need 1600 snails for one gram of colorant. That's a lot of snails. And, uh, but that also shows the, why this color is such an exquisite and expensive color. Uh, Pliny actually says that, um, that uh, one pound of blue purple would cost around a thousand dinars, and uh, that's a, a thousand day wages. So you can also see it's pretty pricey. It's quite up there. And if you are more interested in color, then I, just as last time, I would like to send you in the direction of Elena Lyle's uh, dissertation that she wrote specifically on the color purple in the ancient world. But let's, okay. But now we are there. That's the purple color we like. So let's look at what he's entering. Uh, I'm not gonna give a complete introduction to the tabernacle and the material and the various pieces of equipment in there because uh, it's simply too much. And we, I'll just highlight some of the key things for our purposes today. And also because also here, I have an extremely authentic picture of the tabernacle. Look at that. Pfft. Yeah, well, I'm just joshing because still photography didn't work. But it looks, it gives us an impression of what's happening here because the colors we can't really see. It's colors we can't really see because the colors are contained inside the tabernacle. So inside the tabernacle, the same colors that the high priest wears are found. 
that is two kinds of purple, scarlet or crimson and gold. All of this is covered by skin that becomes less colorful the more you move out. The colors inside the tabernacle are thus visually restricted for outsiders. The only thing you actually can see is the um, is the um, 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 is the um, yes where you walk in where you have something hanging yes that you can see from outside but that is also the only thing that is allowed and um, and I have it has been previously is previously argued by many scholars that um, that we have this we actually have this white. Uh, we have this white circle that uh, that inframes the entire tabernacle, and that is basically the opposite of what the high priest is. He's white on the inside, colorful on the outside, while the tabernacle is white on the outside and colorful on the inside. Um, and uh, I know that for the next slide, you might think, like, why did Sorenstein in academia and didn't like really go for his uh, creative, uh, uh, like, creative artistry side? Because and why is this many works not hanging on various art museums around the world? And I know it's it's how it is, and I will surprise you with the next slide because it is amazing. It is amazing. There we go. And um, we have this uh, beautiful uh, slide um, that um, you can see I've, is a cubism. Nobody knows, but it's definitely there and very pretty. And uh, I definitely did not use two weeks to make this. But um, there we are. As you can see, this beautiful high priest I've made on the left side mimics the colors that we find inside the tabernacle. And the white outline is there. And we can see it here when they are, uh, we have put these things together. You can see on the left side where we have the tabernacle, blue, purple, and red, purple. We have the ephod that has to be a blue, purple on the other side. You shall make the curtain of blue, purple, and red, purple. And uh, you shall also make the screen for the entrance of blue, purple, and red, purple. Those are the purple we are um, looking at now. And at the bottom, we have the fine twisted linen that is this whitish tone. So you see the opposite direction that is going in here um of uh, of of the yeah of the things that we he is wearing and what the tabernacle is made of good yeah but yeah so the thing is there's we have this screen in front that is still colorful and in some ways this screen functions as a door and you need a whole lot of color to enter into. It's like having a key card at the university, yeah? It's like you need the right key card to go all the way in. And if you want to go all the way into the tabernacle, you better be clothed in that entire purple dress of yours because that little tingle tangle that, uh, that, the high, that, the, that the lesser priests have, or you know, the normal priests, that won't allow you, it won't allow you to go all the way in there. You need to be fully covered, fully dressed. You need the whole layer. So, as noted with the high priest, he becomes part of his clothing like this. He gives himself over to becoming this piece of clothing. But the matching layers in the tabernacle also blends the high priest with the surroundings. The clothing is part of the tabernacle's equipment. That's for sure. Like it has to be handed on to the next person. And it is completely useless without a tabernacle. He has to have a tabernacle for this to work. The high priest disappears as he blends into his vestments and into his surroundings. And he can perform the daily rituals without dying in the colorful center. In these vestments, the high priest enters a sort of camouflage, a camouflage we would call a protective resemblance as it is known in the animal world. That is when the animal mimics a more dangerous animal to avoid danger. With this perspective, the high priest mimics the fanciful colors and blends in. But it is not all colors, we have to remember that. It's not all colors of his clothing that blend fully in with the color scheme in the tabernacle. The multicolored stones on his breastplate and the writing on them, as well as the writing on his shoulder stones and the text on the diadem stand out. And for many reasons, it is exactly these things that need to stand out because unlike the high priest, they need to be noticed by God. So, he walks in, and I wonder if it functions in the similar way. You have to remember, this is just uh, like, uh, you know, thoughts I've had. So he walks in, and basically his body disappears into the tabernacle, but the things that do need to be noticed are there. That is, God needs to remember Israel. 
So, and that is exactly what his purpose is, yeah? That is exactly what his purpose is as the high priest, is to represent Israel as he goes in. But uh, let's try to uh, wrap it up here a little and, and, and take this last a little experimental uh, view to these things about colors and danger, because that's actually what drew me to this in the first place. I can always knew that the tabernacle was a dangerous place. You have to wear those bells, man. But also, why? how about those colors? Why is it so necessary for the colors to be not visible? Or, or like, what is it that they should signify in there? Like, that's a whole lot of fabric to use for a whole few people. So um, I came across this book, and it's definitely because of the color. Um, it's a very small book, and it's uh, called Chromophobia. It's David Batchelor, a Scottish, um, as I already mentioned, mentioned a Scottish uh, art historian um, that wrote this. And he wrote this book because he reflects on how color has been uh, an has seen victim, that's how I want to say it, has been a victim of extreme prejudice in the Western culture. By utilizing a weighty vocabulary, Batula states that color has been systematically marginalized, reviled, diminished, and degraded since antiquity. And he labels this intentional aversion toward color chromophobia. That's the word he thought he invented, but he later figured out he didn't. But why has the view on color developed in this way in the Western world? Well, Western intelligentsia, intellectuals, such as Kent and Darwin, preferred black and white drawings over colors that were seen as secondary. They're not far from being the only ones here, because if we look through time, if we just look to the 19th century, white was seen as more sublime. Everything that had to do with color was seen as one of the things that I wrote out here on the right, secondary, excessive, silly, feminine, that's where we are, or dangerous. And we can see that in the 19th century because in the 19th century, they actually figured out that these nice war marble statues we had from Greece, which was supposed to be the most exquisite expression of art, turned out to be polychrome. That was what we figured out. They were not white originally. They had lots of colors. That was quite disappointing and it was quite staggering for a lot of people who had really put white or acrobatic colors into the category of something that was recent, a bit like actually seen as better. So there's been this aversive attitude towards colors. And um, of course, it also goes back, Aristotle, uh, if you read the poetics, uh, where he talks about the plot, he talks about the plot as the white outline, and then the characters who are actually in Aristotle's theory, fairly secondary, they are the colors that fit it in. Like they are the colors that fill it out, I wanted to say. So you can see it doesn't matter if there's three, four, five characters because the plot is the most important thing. But the other side is actually where we are going today is, chromo is chromophobia, well, not so opposite, opposite, chromophilia. That's the love of colors, but that's not really exactly the opposite view because colors are still seen as secondary, excessive, silly, feminine, and dangerous. You just give yourself over to them. You surrender to colors to lose yourself and become part of them. And uh, David Batchelor uses uh, an example of Aldous Huxley taking LSD as, uh, as an example because like that is definitely uh, going in the color direction and losing yourself. But let's try to see with this high priest thing. Because is, is that actually a sort of chromophilia that's happening here? As he dresses in purple, he's not just wearing the only thing that keeps him alive while being in the dangerous and colorful holy place. He loses himself to these colors in order to represent Israel. He loses his individuality, give, them, give himself over to uh, a colorful center to represent Israel. Because we know the tabernacle is a dangerous place. The high priest needs to wear bells in order not to die. Perhaps the breastplate also serves an apotraic function. If you look at much later texts, for example, here, the wisdom of Solomon, uh, it is conceived to have the power, the breastplate, to ward away the destroyer who comes to kill the firstborn. In this way, God's remembrance of the Israelites is not simply for him to remember to take care of the Israelites. It's also for him to remember that he needs to stay away from these tribes. Please don't kill us. Yeah. 
The bells cater to Yahweh's hearing. The incense definitely caters to his smell and the dress caters to his seeing. Um, and together these elements create like this synesthetic phenomenon in which God remembers to keep and not destroy the Israelites. And this entire center is really colorful and dangerous and nobody can just walk in there except if you're wearing this beautiful camouflage. Of course, we have to also think because I have not gone much further on because there's another text in Leviticus 16 where he needs to dress, take all of this dress off. Of course, it's easy to just go in the direction of Nathan McDonald and say, well, they're actually not describing the same clothing, like it is different kinds of clothing that is described. And uh, this needs to be explored more because what function would that have that he dresses, he takes off his clothes, his colorful camouflage in order to be in the Holy of Holies on one day at the year. That's something I'm still thinking about. And the other thing I'm still thinking about is that in Ezekiel 42, uh, 14 and 44, 19, I can give the things later, is that there the high priest is actually not allowed to wear his clothes outside the tabernacle. So we also have to remember that it does it have to stay in there? Is that also part of it? Does he actually show himself? But yeah, we are um, uh, running out of time a little bit, but I will uh, go to just some ends and conclusions here. Let's conclude a little here. <laughs> I had to bring this picture in again because it's so amazing. All right. Uh, well, uh, first of all, the purple clothing is is linked, it's glorious clothing that's linked to the elite. We have touched on this on the previous, um, in the previous lecture, and today we're touching them again. It is expensive. Purple is expensive and it's hard to get by. And it is really connected to the elite. He's dressed the high priest in precious colors and he resembles the divine statue. And um, then we also have that it maybe serves as a sort of protective layer in the dangerous place, a sort of camouflage that keeps danger at bay, or at least keeps the wearer alive so he can come out again and at least give on the clothes to the next one who has to survive. And then there's maybe one that's a perspective that I find a little interesting, and that's the little streak of purple. It was mentioned last um, mentioned last time in our lecture series during the questionnaire round, uh, question and answers round, where this little, little purple streak uh, that the Israelites have to wear for remembrance. And, and actually that was what prompted this perspective on me is like, so we have this gradation in how much color you are to wear. The high priest is fully dressed, completely purple from top to toe. He goes in to be the purple thing there in order for God to remember. God needs to remember inside the tabernacle. That is the very key important thing. But there seems to be this purple thread that goes through Israel, through the, through the, uh, through the, uh, the lower Levite, Levitical uh, priests, and then to the ordinary everyday uh, Israelite who wears this little fringe of blue purple cord. And what is it for in numbers? It is to remember God. So this memory has two different, uh, it plays on, on two different spectrums. One is God's memory of the Israelites and the other one is the Israelites memory of God. And they wear this slightly purple cloth to remember God by. And I think actually that's where um, we can end now, but it is also where I am um, in the direction I'm heading, I guess, actually in my, um, I think in my, in my research is this more direction of like, what about these small tokens of memory? They are absolutely fascinating. And why do they need to function in the visual memory? And what connection does this little blue cord, uh, blue purple cord have in connection with the tabernacle? Also, if it's connected at all. But yeah, but uh, thank you. I think that was my time. Thank you so much, Saren. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you also, I must say, for, for sharing your... Um your recent uh, piece of, uh, of Cubist artwork with us. We're, we're very appreciative of that. But uh, see, I'll just see if I can get a, a Zoom applause started here. Um, and I, I really, really appreciate how you sort of show us um, the sense almost of, uh, of the sanctuary uh, with, with both olfaction, vision and sound, really fascinating. Um, 
but we have time now for questions and comments and discussions. So please go ahead. Uh, I think there we may be one or two people. To, no, I think I might actually be able to see everyone uh, on my screen. So if you'd like to uh, to make a comment um, or a question, you can either send me a message in the chat or uh, just raise your virtual hand in Zoom. And um, while people find virtual hands and so on, I, I might get us started with a question actually. Um, Søren, you mentioned towards the end of your talk, you mentioned Leviticus 16. So I know you've been thinking about this a little bit. And, I, and I, I was thinking, yeah, what if instead of reading with Nathan McDonald yeah. that it's not the same clothes because we're sort of de dealing with different traditions, yeah. what if what if we focus on the fact that it's not exactly the same place that the high priest is entering so yeah. norm normally he would enter the holy but in leviticus 16 on the day of atonement mm -hmm. he enters the holy of holies so he he enters the innermost room once a year yeah um so would, yeah. would that would and because yeah. there is and and then all of a sudden the camouflage he needs is the cloud of incense in the linen clothes yeah. and so so would you would you accept that proposal that the <laughs> the colorful camouflage yeah. works in the outer room but for yeah. that once a year when you have to go all the way in yeah. uh, and actually cross the innermost boundary of the sanctuary then yeah. um then it's a different kind of camouflage that is needed that calls for plain linen clothes and and a cloud of incense to yeah. wear yeah, I, th I think that's actually like, of course, it's also, as I, I, I kind of like uh, hinted at a little bit, it's this synesthetic thing that we probably also have to to look at. So it makes sense that, you know, there is incense too. And um, I remember Jan Dietrich has, uh, uh, my professor here has argued somewhere that this, especially that in, in the innermost sanctum, uh, we have this um, where everything gets a little blurry. Like what is this kavod of God anyways, this presence of God and then the incense and what, like, can we even see anything in there? And I uh, uh, imagine this, uh, when I was a kid, there was this steam, uh, this steam bath uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in where I grew up and it, you opened and you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see a hand in front of you. It was like this fancy steam bath. And then they creepily had put a, a bust in the corner, uh, like literally a head of a person. And it was absolutely creepy because suddenly you saw it. But I imagine sometimes that it could be in a sense like that, you wouldn't need the camouflage in there. There is the slight issue uh, that is, it's not a shish uh, robe that he's wearing, but a butt uh, robe. Yes. Uh, so that's the only thing like, and that's where I find that Nathan McDonald's argument that are we also in the same clothing here? Is it fine to just use a synonym of something that describes uh, the same kind of clothing, uh, this white uh, dress, or, or or are we actually in somewhere uh, different? Hmm. Yeah. Like a typical a typical interpretation is, of course, also that you uh, that it's a sign of humility. That's the one you see the most. You yeah, know, the plain the plain the linen linen. Yeah. yeah. You show up yeah. in the white stuff. That's what you do. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I still have point. to think about it. But it's a well, different place. More incense, maybe. Yeah. A little more kept out of God, too. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's it's a really interesting example of a different kind of use of incense in a ritual setting because we're so used to association associating incense with all faction, and then all of a sudden the yeah. the use of incense in this context is all about vision, actually. Yeah. Um, mm. So yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. And I look forward to hearing what you what you think. <laughs> I'll get back to you in January. Excellent. Yeah. Um, please go ahead. Anyone who'd like to make a comment or uh, or ask a question. Let's see if I can keep track of everyone here. I'm not seeing anyone at the moment, actually, but Please let me know if you have anything you'd like to say. Otherwise, I'm going to continue with another question myself, if that's okay. Which is, um, we're speaking about the linen, and and you mentioned um, the description of the fine linen and how that's probably white. But then I I thought there's also this description of the textiles, both in the high priest clothing and in the sanctuary, where mm. it says fine twisted linen. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on twisted linen? 
yeah like uh, we because i think i think we brought this up at the last uh, lecture as well like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and i was sitting like i bet this is coming next time too uh yeah and <laughs> I, I, I and i have not made any in much more thought into it like or that more that in a sense like i i i thought it was leaning towards the like how it was made like a like a more um, um, a special kind of um, technique basically. Mm. Is is uh, is where I am. Um, is what I would uh, uh, recall. Yeah. yeah. But I but I do not have a learned answer. Uh, although maybe I should. Fair but enough. Yeah. No, but it's true. And last time with Laura, we did talk about also the yeah. whether it's it's woven, colorful yeah. fabric, or whether it's embroidered. Whereas, yeah. as far as I remember, Ooh. Laura yeah. thought probably embroidered rather than woven. That's that's how it was. Yes. Yeah. No, that's yeah. good. Well, I. Yeah. have a couple of questions here now in the chat. The first one is from Marte. Marte, would you like to ask it yourself? See if Marte is coming on. Uh, thank you for an interesting lecture. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate on the significance on, of the different stones on the breastplate. Um, yeah, the different stones on the breastplate. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, uh, well, the different stones, they have, they have, you will see in translations that they would have different, um, they will have different uh, trans, like they would definitely have different names. Uh, there are some stones that we can definitely uh, identify. Um, for example, uh, lapis lazuli is there like a turquoise in the sense of like a, a bluish tone. Um, that is uh, fairly easy to uh, identify. Uh, we also are pretty sure that, uh, you know, the carnelian uh, stone is a red stone. Um, and that's why I said that you can, you, we can be quite sure that green and red uh, is some of the stones we'll find here. Uh, like blue and uh, blue and red are some of the stones we'll find here. But a lot of the our other stones are, are left a little to the imagination sometimes. Like what kind of color do we actually have? It's also because sometimes a stone might refer to a... Um, basically, a, 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 a grundstoff, which is then, um, yeah, basically a, a, a stone in nature, right? But that will have different colors depending on uh, depending on on where it's found, um, and that's why the colors are a little hard to identify. Uh, when that is said, then we have uh, there are there are have been some pretty good. Um, there's an article that I've referenced a couple of times about um, they have, who have tried to identify the different colors and also what kind of a chemical a compound is it actually we have to deal with here. Um, um, and and um, but they mostly ended up the same place as me a lot of times, you know, with the yeah, we can be sure that these colors are, are, are there, but the other colors maybe not. But a lot of the colors in the end, maybe I just want to say that is also what you would find uh, today sometimes in crystal shops, you know, like uh, the, uh, you know, um, yeah, wh whatever, uh, whatever crystal that might have a, a specific power of something. Yeah. Yeah. Marta, please go ahead if you have a yeah. follow up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was exactly what I was wondering about, the, yeah. like the symbolism of uh, different yeah. uh, um, jewel stones. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had uh, questions uh, from my uh, congregations about that. Of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. I see why. Like, it, it's it's no it's no wonder. Like, uh, because they do. Uh, they so there's no specific. Um, there we can't find fully like a specific thing in the Hebrew Bible, like saying that this stone has a healing effect or this stone has a uh, like a, a, not for the twelve stones in the breastplate, but they are sure. Um, um, uh, if we look into the ancient Near East in general, the, the stones are, are also have a specific kind of symbolism and maybe also both apotropaic, so like keeping away dangerous functions and also like some kind of my, maybe healing functions. But I need to look into that a little more. But there's no doubt that, for example, lapis lazuli, the blue color is, is very, it's a very, very um, specific color that has a very specific um, value in the ancient Near East. Like for example, in Tutankhamun's um, uh, burial mas mask, you see the blue lapis lazuli all around. And uh, it might, and all of the, actually all of the gods in, the, in ancient uh, Egypt always had blue hair. There was lapis lazuli hair. Their hair was made of lapis lazuli blue and their uh, skin was made of uh, gold and their um, bones were made of silver. 
Uh, and the, but you see, like the lapis lazuli might maybe have even more to it as a form of symbolism. But I will, I will, uh, I'll try to look further. I I know that our colleague in uh, in Hamburg, uh, Corinna Kurting, yes. has done a recent, relatively recent study on gemstones in the Hebrew Bible. True. Um, have you Have you looked it up? Uh, because I must admit I haven't, but I just know it's there. Yes, I also know it there, and I I have. I have it, um, but uh, but um, yes, but not fully studied. No, no, on the to-do list. Very good. On the to-do list. Yeah. Okay. Thank Even you, Mark. Um, I think there was a comment here from uh, Susanne as well, and I think we're going back to uh, to the different kinds of manufacture of uh, of textiles, mm -hmm. uh, and and the twisted linen. Susanne, would you like to uh, to make the comment yourself? Yeah. Yes, um, here I am. Well, um, I just had the idea that twisted linen might refer to twill weave, because um, a twill weave um, gives um, stripes going along the garment or the cloth. And um, these two types of weave of weaving were already um, used, as I think, even in the Stone Age. So even twill weave is very, very old. Mm. So maybe th this is can, I just thought maybe this could be meant with it. And I have also another question concerning the uh, breastplate. Um, can you see, is there any relationship towards contemporary jewelry? Um, because you will have, um, especially Carmelian, Turkish, and Lapis Lazulu, they're used very frequently in jewelry in the ancient Near East, especially in Egypt, but also in other um, cultures like Assyria. Is there maybe a relationship? between jewelry that has been found archaeologically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, generally, like uh, the jewelry uh, um, is, is actually uh, quite homogeneous, uh, like across the ancient Near East, sometimes you will find like a lot of the, especially lapis lazuli is used for jewelry, all from, from, from the West to the East, that is, it is, it's definitely like that. Um, um, yeah, of course, gold and silver also to some extent. Um, all of the more specifics, but lapis lazuli keeps so well. So, like you have, uh, it's very, it's very easy to uh, to find that. So, actually, I would say that basically any museum you go into uh, with ha who has that has a Egyptian and a Mesopotamian, um, which where we would be somewhere in the middle, uh, would have a, um, would have some kind of jewelry made of lapis lazuli. Yeah, that is almost certain. I think definitely also carnelian. If you if you go into something like seals, yeah, which of course has a sort of dual function as jewelry as well. You'd, there mm. are quite a lot of carnelian seals that have been discovered. Yeah. Um, but but how how certain are we on the translation, sir? And I mean, are we? Yeah. Yeah. Do we are. That's okay. the thing. That that is, we are not so certain on the translations. Uh, like for, I think, uh, no, oh, man, I, sh I should be just taking that out. But like, I think uh, around like maybe half we are kind of like there we are on the twelve stones on the like half we we are we are more or less sure that this is the actual thing that it refers to, um, uh, and the other not. So, but okay. I, I I need to maybe re um, take my words back when I have looked it up in the, the fine article I have. Great, thank you, and thank you, Susanna, for for bringing that up as well. Um, and I and and the twill weave, I think, is is a really interesting perspective, especially because if you look at the textiles in the sanctuary, um, the twisted linen is also used together with often used together with other colors. So you you could almost imagine some kind of of combined weaving technique. But um, but uh, Chester Madrasso has a has a question here. Uh, Chester, would you like to to ask it yourself? See. Oh, okay. Chester, Chester is not able to to come on, so I'll just read it up um, here. It says a broader question about attire and clothing. Can you speak to any connection between the symbolic role of clothing in the Garden of Eden, protecting from the shame of nakedness? and the role of priestly uh, clothing. Yeah. Oh, well, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, well I, I think there's actually some, somehow two questions here, because one thing is about, you know, like the question of, uh, of clothing in the Garden of Eden, uh, which is um, 
which we basically get explained that now they know they were naked and they get dressed, you know, like, and that is, has something to do with uh, with that ideological question. The other one is the nakedness of the high priest, because the high priest is actually the only one like who has to wear underwear, because when he walks over, like the priests have to do that in general, because like you are not allowed to see um, their nether regions uh, when they walk over holy places, um, uh, which is quite unique but of course it uh, but of course it that shows if there is a specific connection between uh, the garden of eden story and the high priest um um ooh, yeah, that's nothing it's not something i've thought about um, in, in depth but like it could be but definitely the the aspect of shame is there like uh, that that uh, or something that has to do with what's actually going on um um with the uh, with the uh, so, so actually, I, like when I'm thinking here, like I think one thing is for the high priest is that the, it's basically God who's not allowed to see the uh, a penis or something. Like um, maybe it's it's, and it's not really the same problem in the Garden of Eden. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe somebody else have like a really good idea to this because like um, 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 yeah. But I, I do want to emphasize, of course, that that the priest specifically has to wear undergarments. Yeah, like uh, that, that is very important. Yeah. Chester, I was when you talk about clothing in the Garden of Eden, did you mean specifically the the covering that the humans do for themselves, or were you thinking about the the skin clothing that Yahweh gives to them just before he 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 sort of kicks them out of the garden towards the end of chapter three, because um, because I, I suppose in a way there is, in the Garden of Eden, there is sort of two clothing sessions. Oh, yeah. and Chester writes that he's, he thinks in a way both. So yeah. so both the, the leaves and the... Both the leaves and the skin. And the leather, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah that's a really good question. Well, as a fabric-wise, then uh, the high priest's clothing is made of neither. You know, the materiality is not the same. Uh, we have the tabernacle is covered in skin, and that's a different sense altogether. That might actually um, be for material reasons to keep water out. Uh, like a, um, that could be a thing, depending on how legit the story is. Um, yeah. But the re my reason for sort of moving yeah. towards the skin clothing is that it says it seems to be quite obvious in Genesis three that that's for protection, and I yeah. suppose there could be sort of at least an overall connection there between protecting the humans with clothing and if we follow your reading then the high priest's attire is also at least partly for his own protection so yeah true Chester mm -hmm. would, did you feel that you got an answer to your question <laughs> would you like to come back <laughs> I smell your sweet treat yeah oh it's an interesting connection that the high priest have to wear underwear yeah and the distinguishing between the two sets of clothing is good too thank you well thank you um thank you for keeping it going yeah yeah elisa please go ahead yeah thank you very much uh Seren. i'm sorry this is really super fascinating and i'm sorry uh my question is really fuzzy and my thoughts are really fuzzy i was also interrupted a few times um by a colleague during your presentation but i remember oh, your slide so where you had the um yeah, priest and his or high priest and his clothing, and then the continuity between that and the the tabernacle, and then it made me think of this microcosmos, uh, macrocosmos mm -hmm. thing, and and somehow how like different realms of reality, uh, of spider, they they reflect uh, each other, or, or or there is some, yeah, they're somehow in sync with with each other. But then I wasn't quite sure, like um, I didn't have enough time to think this through. Like what would be the would the would the priest be the 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 microcosm and the 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 tabernacle the the macrocosm or would would they both be sort of microcosmos and and then the macrocosmos would be some kind of di divine uh, realm or yeah, yeah. I, I don't know this might not make any any sense but it just mm -hmm. um yeah came to my mind didn't have time to think it through. Yeah. No, but thank you, Elisa. Good to hear you. Uh, um, I think I've seen it, it. I've seen it in some way that that the entire sphere there inside the tabernacle um, makes a, makes a whole of a, of a like a set apart 
realm, basically, that, that is quite colorful. Um, um, so I, like, I think in my head, I've, I've, I've thought that it's, it's, it's basically, a, um, mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I I, th I think I I I'm I'm leaning towards this idea that it's 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 in there like that it's a fully a, a sort of world set apart by color and 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 other stuff and then uh, you uh, and uh, and maybe the distinction between microcosm and macrocosm I I would not necessarily make I think because it it becomes blurred um, together but it's a very good thought. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I think your 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 mic is off. And, oh, thank you, Soren. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much, Elisa. And uh, and Ehud, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I kept thinking a bit about the balance between the camouflage that you talk about, mm. meaning that the high priest disappears as it were, melts yeah. within the tabernacle, yeah. and the tendency to do exactly the opposite. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, the hat emits a bit of light, which obviously makes him, uh, okay, uh, uh, easy to, <laughs> to identify. Uh, you have the stones for, obvious reasons is a way of reminding uh, God of Israel, okay? Yeah. Um, from another sensorial aspect, the bells, yes, defend him, but uh, makes sure that he does not, uh, you know, mixes, disappears as it were within the tabernacle. Uh, would you like to perhaps, uh, I tend to see a kind of balance there between yeah. camouflage and non-camouflage. Yeah. What uh, you will think? <laughs> yeah. You might think that that is exactly uh, that is exactly where I was I was pivoting on also with the title that is this weird duality that uh, he somehow has to be there but not really. Um, um, of course, he he has to uh, light uh, the lights as well, and that would make him visible in a little bit. Uh, but I think. I think, in the sense that that the things that will also shine inside a tabernacle is, of course, things made of metal like gold. Um, they would shine very nicely in there when you light up the light, and uh, his fabric clothes would uh, then uh, kind of absorb it more, also because it's a dark color. So that would also yeah. not reflect too much of light. Um, but but then I think I come I circle back to that thing again that he he exactly lights the menorah or, or, or does what he does. Uh, in order to then uh, actually get the shiny parts to shine a little more, so the the thing in his his forehead, like the the, the diadem and the breastplate again, and the onyx stones maybe also. So uh, so in, in that way he plays on that doubleness that that he's there but not there, uh, and I think that's um, uh, and I, I I think that's that's more in the direction I was I was I was aiming at uh, as a, a thought of uh, uh, a sort of thought experiment. Um, and uh, perhaps we may add that because of this doubleness, when he gets out and people see him, yeah. he is the basically embodied tabernacle. Yes, yeah. Yeah, he has, yeah, that's for sure. He has, he wears everything that's inside. And the only thing that's not inside uh, is the stones. Like uh, that's, uh, that doesn't have an equivalent uh, of color uh, or material for that matter inside yeah. of the tabernacle. So, in some ways, he when he goes out, he he has both. He both is he is at the inside of the tabernacle, but he's also still representing Israel to themselves. Yeah, so that's yeah, a, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's this bad. duality, this balance that I yeah. found so yeah. interesting. It is very interesting, and I think it is this, that duality, but also the question of like how is, uh, yeah, because because if the Israelites see him, of course, then he is representing God out there. But if it's Ezekiel who are more likely, you know, he has to place his clothes inside the tabernacle. That was, I just mentioned quickly right at the end that, that in, in that more idealistic temple there, the, the clothes are supposed to stay in the tabernacle. Then, then the Israelites won't really see it. 
um, is is what I um, yeah. So I've actually been looking through: Are the Israelites actually going to see this close? Will they actually see it, or is it supposed to only be inside of the tabernacle? And um, yeah. And there is the issue that if he he's to some, let's assume for a moment that uh, despite Ezekiel, uh, Israelites could see yeah. he's both the a kind of statue yeah. and the tabernacle, and at the same time neither one. Yeah. 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 I think that's 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 also where I was aiming at exactly that there is this it's um, yeah. It's not either or, it's like a both and, uh, and uh, yeah. And neither, both and and neither. <laughs> yeah, maybe that, 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 that would be it. This is, this is getting very complex for a Friday afternoon. Yes. But, uh, no, but, but I think, and this is beautiful also when, you, when we think about Laura's lecture, lecture uh, was it three weeks ago roughly, where we talked about how there is an overlap, a conceptual overlap between deity, statue, sanctuary, mm -hmm. and priesthood. That in in a way, this is a at least a related or a cognate uh, line of thinking, which is is really interesting. Yeah, very and thank you so much, Ehud. And and it's a little bit of a funny coincidence, but Ehud was in Oslo last week, mm -hmm. and I I had the pleasure of of chatting to him over lunch, and we actually talked about the rule about the high priest garments and how he's he has to wear underwear where and i don't know sir and if you're familiar with deborah rook um there was an edited volume called embroidered garments where mm. she um uh, where she had an, a chapter about the the high priest's uh, underwear yeah um and um and and there her, there she tried to promote this idea that it's sort of you have to to hide your genitalia as a high priest so as not to provoke the masculinity of the deity where mm -hmm. where Ehud and I actually just talked about this last week uh, and 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 decided that we thought probably it's more of a of a question of common decency in a way yeah. that it's just common sense yeah. Uh, yeah. when when you walk up steps in front of a, a yeah. potential audience uh, um, but well, but then perhaps that's a masculinity priest and deities perhaps is for another time. Yeah. Um, but um, well, we're approaching the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, but before I send you off to have a lovely weekend, we have time maybe for one comment or question is if anyone's uh, not had their chance yet. It doesn't look like it. Um, well, then. Before I thank you all and thank Saren especially for his uh, really interesting talk this afternoon, I'm just going to tell you when we meet again, uh, because next time is on Friday the 11th of November, and then we're moving a little bit up in time uh, because we have Dr. Mary Harlow, who's going to talk about female dress at Rome, uh, getting it right. And if I um, understood uh, Dr. Harlow correctly, this is very much a talk that's about what Roman men thought that Roman women ought to wear. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is bound to be really interesting. And for those of you who are interested in clothing and textiles of the Roman world, you will know that Dr. Harlow, uh, she's, she's not only written the book, she's written and edited all the books on the topic. So uh, she is a, a fountain of, uh, of knowledge on this. But Friday, 11th November at 3 p.m. Oslo time. And then thank you so much, all of you, for coming and being with us this afternoon. And thank you especially, Saren, for your amazing talk. Uh, very stimulating, very interesting. Thank you so much. <laughs>